Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Beth Darmstadter. I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer at the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. I'm really pleased to have Mike Matil here with First National Bank. Mike is the Director of Wealth Planning. And this is part three of a three-part series sponsored by First National Bank um, on financial planning. Um, this session is going to provide you with financial tips for people of all ages. So we're going to cover a little bit of everything. And we'll have a question and answer session after um, the presentation by Mike. So um, please use the chat to enter any questions you may have. We'll be back momentarily after the presentation from Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Kenny, the Creative Director at the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Matil of First National Bank. Mike is a Senior Vice President and Director of Wealth Planning of FNB Wealth Management, which is a part of First National Bank and FNB Corporation. He's here today to share some advice about investing and retirement planning at every stage of life. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the YMCA community about financial wellness at every stage of life. I'm the Director of Wealth Planning at FNB Wealth Management. And I'm lucky enough to be able to have these very conversations with our clients and their families every day. Talking to them about financial education and helping them understand and gain clarity about their financial future. Throughout this session, Mike will provide sound advice on where to go to seek reliable information, best practices, and what potential challenges may arise as you begin to save and pursue your financial goals. I encourage you to ask questions related to the discussion after this concludes. We all hear that investing for retirement is important, but for many of us, we tend to think that investing is something people who are already wealthy do, and that it may not be for them because they don't have a lot of disposable income. Does someone have to have a bunch of money just sitting in a bank account before they start thinking about investing for retirement? Well, that's a great point. Uh, I think too often people think investing and stock market is just for the wealthy, uh, which is untrue. And Really, the theme here is it's never too early to start investing, and there's never too little money to start investing with. I think the most important thing is to start a discipline of saving and investing early and allowing that money and savings to work for you throughout your life. Now, you say it's never too early to start investing. When and how should people start? Really, uh, what I think is as soon as people start earning income, it's important to start thinking about savings and investing instead of waiting till you're 50, 60 years old to start thinking about retirement. And so I think being proactive in that process and understanding that your risks will change as you go through life. And at each stage of life, you'll have different risks and different opportunities and having a proactive plan so that your financial plan evolves with your life. So if I'm just starting out in my career, maybe I'm fresh out of school in my early 20s without a lot of income, how would you advise me to think about investing? Well, for an early uh, investor, someone in their early 20s, I think what's important is two things. First, creating an emergency reserve, a cash reserve. Uh, we never know when these events arise in our life. It could be a car repair. It could be a um, health emergency or it could be being laid off from your job. We've all seen over the past year and a half, two years through the pandemic, people losing their job through no faults of their, fault of their own. So it's important to have that reserve in place so that uh, you are self-insuring if those events were happen to you. And, and keep that in cash. And ideally that's six to 12 months of reserves, and I know that that's hard to start with, uh, but to begin chipping away at that so you have that fund, I think is the first priority. Next, then, as you have uh, start your career, uh, hopefully you have an employer-sponsored retirement plan, and that, such as a 401k, a 403b, that will allow you to contribute pre-tax dollars to that plan to start saving for retirement. And, and those have two benefits, really, in my mind. Uh, the first is the dollars you contribute are pre-tax, so they're not included in your taxable income. They'll lower your tax bill, which is a great thing. And the second important piece of that is it's money that doesn't even uh, add to your paycheck. So you don't see it in your net pay. It's just being contributed. 
Many employers also offer a matching contribution where they will match your contribution dollar for dollar, however much you contribute. So starting that process early, and if your employer uh, provides a match up to three, five, six percent of, of your salary, depending on how much you contribute, it's important for you to contribute at least enough to get that match from your employer. That's free money towards your retirement. So what does the next stage of life look like? How does your thinking about investing evolve? Yeah, great question. I think as people enter their late 20s into their 40s, my first concern is inflation. And I don't mean the rising cost of goods and services like we're seeing in the news now, although that could certainly be a concern. I think of lifestyle inflation. So as people earn more money, not spending all of that extra money, um, and, and then they're back to not being able to save any or back to living paycheck to paycheck. So paying yourself first as you earn more money is an important first step. As you uh, go through life, you will hopefully accumulate uh, more assets, perhaps have a family. So you'll want to contribute dollars to an insurance program. You're going to want to protect your assets. You're going to want to protect your income and your goals. And so uh, taking, allocating dollars towards life insurance, disability insurance, health insurance, those are all important pieces and, and good uses of your money. So as you earn more money, hopefully, throughout your career, contributing and increasing your contributions to your 401k plan or your employer plan, uh, a good strategy is just every year automatically increasing your contribution amount by 1%. You won't notice it in your paycheck, and it really makes a difference over the long term in your investment savings. And then as you do have a family, perhaps, and you have certain goals with that, maybe you want to contribute to your child's college uh, education, using a 529 plan, uh, some tax deferred savings vehicle uh, to pay for that goal, could be another use of your dollars. So as I'm moving through that second stage of life, maybe starting to reach a point where I've achieved a salary that affords me some disposable income, I could start taking much fancier vacations. But I'm thinking about the long term. How do I start maximizing returns on my investments to build a nest egg? How should I think about where I invest from a risk perspective? Yeah, I certainly don't want to stop people from taking fancy vacations. Uh, so that's not my intention. But understanding that as you earn more money, paying yourself first through that process. Beyond that, I'm glad you termed that as investment risk, because I do think about risk at each stage of life. And, and there's a couple of components to investment risk. The first is taking too much risk and being uncomfortable with how much risk you're taking as an investor. But the other side of that is taking too little risk. And you can't simply keep money in cash for the long term. It won't keep pace with inflation, and you will erode the power of your savings. So there is a balance there that you need to find, understanding what your goal is and what the time horizon for your goal is. Generally speaking, the shorter the time horizon, the less risk you should take with those funds. So for instance, an emergency reserve should be in cash because you don't know when you'll need those funds and you shouldn't subject them to the short-term volatility in the market, stock market. Longer-term goals, such as retirement, if those are 30, 40, if that goal is 30, 40 years down the road, then you should be willing to take more risk in hopes of generating greater returns and allowing that money to work for you and grow for you over the long term. What does the next stage look like then? As we're maybe approaching the latter years in our careers and retirement starts to feel like it's a lot closer than it used to be. Yeah, that, that hits home. Uh, it does feel a lot closer than it used to. Uh, so at this stage of your life, what I think you should do, and this I'm thinking 15, 10, 15 years out from retirement, I think about retirement in income streams. So start projecting your various streams of income in retirement. The first could be your 401k savings or your, your savings through work. And likely there will be calculators through your 401k provider or your retirement plan provider that will estimate how much your savings is projected to be based on your contributions and the growth of those over your life. So at retirement, here's your balance and a safe 3-4% withdrawal rate would equal X amount of monthly income. 
That's one piece. The second piece may be a pension, if you have a pension through your work, or Social Security. You can go to the Social Security's website and uh, create an account, and they will provide projections for you based on your work history of what your Social Security benefit could be over various points in time in retirement. And so adding those together and understanding what your income stream will look like based on that and how that compares to your current lifestyle or 80% of your lifestyle. And if you're far away from that, then you know you have work to do over the next 10, 15 years until retirement and save more. And if you're on track, then great, keep doing what you're doing. And that gets us to a big concern for a lot of folks. Once they reach retirement, how do they make the money last? Yeah, so again, I think doing those projections first is important and having confidence that you've planned for that up front. Uh, the next piece is looking at your investment horizon. We talked about longer term horizon being riskier with your money, perhaps. Shorter term, as retirement nears, you'll want to take less risk with your money. And so understanding where you fall in that. Um, and the third component is understanding when you want to retire. And as you get closer to retirement, that may be dictated by how you feel about work, uh, when you The other component is understanding when you want to retire. And, and that may be out of your control through health circumstances. It may be something that based on your own projections, you've determined you need to work a few more years or you're right on track. The last piece that I don't think enough people consider is healthcare expenses. So in retirement, if you do retire before you're eligible for Medicare at age 65, you will need to purchase private health insurance coverage. So you need to plan for that in your cost estimates. Even with Medicare, there is a cost component to that through Medicare premiums, supplemental insurance, out-of-pocket costs. So understanding what those costs could be and projecting them into your retirement income streams is important as well. This is a great way to approach investing over the course of a career or throughout adult life. But what if I missed the memo when I was in the early part of my career? What if I'm in my mid-30s or 40s or even my 50s? Is it just too late for me? Are there ways for me to make up ground? Well, just like I said, it's never too early to start. It's never too late to start either. So uh, federal law allows you from age 50 on to contribute more to your employer plans or an individual retirement account known as a catch-up provision. And hopefully at that stage of life, you'll have more discretionary cash flow to allocate to that savings. Perhaps you're making more money or you have less expenses at home. Maybe your children have moved out of the house and you're saving on food or education. And you can take those dollars and really start allocating them more towards your retirement. And how do folks find out more about all of this? And how can they connect with an FNB investment specialist? At FNB, we've dedicated a tremendous amount of resources on our website for financial education. So our website, fnb-online.com, has a personal section with a knowledge center in there. And we have a whole library of materials covering these subjects for your education. We'd also, of course, be happy to have your viewers stop by our branch and speak to one of our financial professionals so we can gain an understanding of what your concerns are and how we may be able to help you. Well, thank you, Mike, for sharing your insights today about creating an investment strategy for every stage of life. Before we open it up to Q&A with the audience, is there anything that you'd like to add? Well, I think that the main takeaways from today is it's never too early or too late to begin saving for retirement. The important thing is to create that discipline and start now. And if you need help, there are professionals uh, who dedicate their entire career to helping you with these issues. And of course, at FNB, we'd be happy to, to speak with you as well. Thanks, Mike. And now, let's take some questions from the audience. So one of the questions, Mike, that came in was, I'm thinking about changing jobs, but I have a 401k with my current employer. What do I do with it when I move? That's a great question. And a lot of people are switching jobs now. And you really have a few choices with your 401k when you switch roles. 
uh, perhaps your employer will let you keep your 401k where it is, um, even after you leave. Some may, some, some don't. Uh, you would have the opportunity to roll the funds into an individual retirement account. What you want to avoid is taking custody of those funds. You'll want to open an IRA and just have those funds directly transferred and rolled into that IRA. It may give you perhaps lower fees, more investment choices, so that is a, a popular option. A third option is perhaps you could roll your balance from your old employer to your new employer's 401k. Um, not every employer allows that, but it's worth checking with your new employer if you're able to do so. What you don't want to do is cash out those funds. Uh, certainly, if you're under 59 and a half, they, there will be a penalty, a 10% penalty, and regardless of your age, all of that, uh, the balance will be considered taxable ordinary income to you. So those are really retirement funds that you want to keep in a retirement account, either with your old 401k, your new 401k, or rolling into an uh, individual retirement account. Great, thank you. I'm gonna actually selfishly throw in a question that I have when you mentioned 59 and a half. I don't wanna disclose my age, but I will say I'm close to that age. Mm -hmm. So rather than waiting until 60 or 65 um, ages in which perhaps there are um, you know, financial and investment related and tax related considerations that come into play when you retire, are there things I should be doing as I approach 60 um, well before I turn 65? Or do you just kind of wait until you're almost at 65 and then you make some of those changes? From a retirement plan perspective? Yeah. So really, um, the 59 and a half is important for withdrawals okay. and anything before that. There's, there's some slight tweaks if you're over 55 and you leave your employment. You, you may be able to avoid a penalty. But as a general rule, 59 and a half is only important from the standpoint of if you withdraw funds, uh, you'll be subject to a penalty on those. Mm -hmm. Starting at age 50, you could make extra contri contributions okay. to your retirement account. Uh, those are called catch-up contributions. So for uh, instance, for your 401k, um, you could provide up to $6,500 this year in additional contributions than what you would normally be allowed to contribute. For an IRA, it's $1,000 okay. extra contribution. So starting at age 50, you can, you can catch up those contributions if, if you need to. Um, but really the 59 and a half is important from a withdrawal standpoint and the okay. penalties. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question. I want to start investing, but I'm worried that I'll need my money if something bad happens. How do I get to my funds if I really need them? Sure, that's a great question and, and a lot of people's concerns. If you have your investments in what I'll call normal investments, mutual funds, stocks, those should be fully liquid. And if you need cash, you need to sell those investments to raise cash. Um, usually you can have the, the cash one to two days after the sale. Um, the only caveat to that would be if you have your investments in some sort of private investment or proprietary product that would have a lockup period uh, or perhaps an annuity with a surrender charge where you would actually lose money if you were to withdraw funds during the withdrawal, the surrender period. Um, but from a normal standpoint, uh, there's, there's no there's total liquidity and total access to your investment funds, provided that they are not in a retirement account. And you could still withdraw funds from your retirement account, a 401k, an IRA. The only difference for that would be uh, if you are under 59 and a half, you'd be subject to a 10% penalty and any income you withdraw from your retirement account would be subject to ordinary income as opposed to perhaps capital gains from a non-retirement account, from a basic investment account. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. Another question we got in was, we were totally unprepared when my mom needed to go into assisted living. Mm. Is there anything my husband and I can do to get ahead of something like that? Well, uh, unfortunately, many of us are unprepared for that, for our parents, uh, for ourselves. And we only find out about uh, what we need to know from, from going through it with a loved one ourselves. And, and I've been in that situation myself too. And so it, you do learn a lot um, going through that. 
And you, one of the things you do learn is it is important to prepare as much as you can and understanding what the potential costs are, what the options are. Um, as I mentioned before, Medicare won't cover assisted living. Medicaid will, but that requires you to either do sophisticated planning years in advance or spend all of your assets down. Uh, so I think there is long-term care insurance and that's worth at least exploring um, if you're you know, in an age and a health bracket where um, it may make sense. It's at least worth exploring what the cost of long-term care insurance is and that will either reimburse you or pay directly for those long-term care expenses for perhaps assisted living. Um, and oftentimes people see that if they have long-term care, that the, pre the payments from long-term care insurance combined with pension or social security is enough to cover most of the cost of assisted living. But it can be pricey and it's, it's certainly something that um, you want to account for as you look at your retirement planning. And is long-term care insurance something that um, some workplaces offer as a, as a benefit? It, 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 it's rarer to see it as a workplace benefit, but there are private insurance products mm -hmm. uh, for long-term care. And so you can go to an insurance advisor and ask about long-term care. There's uh, a lot of different policies. It can be a, sort of a confusing landscape of, of products if you're not familiar with it, but understanding what the coverage is, what you would be receiving if you ever need it, and what the cost would be, and you can plug that into your retirement projections, mm -hmm. um, I think is, is an important exercise. Great, thanks. I don't have an estate, in quotes, but I want to make sure my kids get everything they can when I'm not here. What are my options? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think so many people hear the word estate and they think you have to be some landowning baron to, <laughs> to have that. And it's not the case. Every, every single person has an estate. And, and whether you know it or not, every single person has an estate plan. The state of Ohio provides in their laws what happens to your assets if you don't have a will. And that will vary based if you're married or not, if you have children or not. Um, but the state of Ohio has an estate plan for you. You can bypass that and have your own plan by simply having a will. And so if you have minor children, you're going to want to have a will so you can choose who the guardian of your children are. You can choose the ultimate disposition of your assets and where those go. Uh, so having a will is important for anyone of any wealth any age. And the second piece to this concept of estate plan, which I don't think enough people consider, is not only the document of having a will, but also beneficiary designations. Mm -hmm. So for uh, products like life insurance policies, retirement accounts, your 401k, your IRA, those will have beneficiary designations, people you can choose who receive the funds. And those are completely separate from your will. Regardless of what your will says, your beneficiary designations will control. And that's an important part to coordinate with your, with your total estate plan. I've seen too many people, perhaps they have a life insurance policy that they buy or get through work when they have their first child and they name their child as a, a beneficiary. And then they forget about it. And they have more children and they never add those other children as beneficiaries. And their will may say everything is split equally between their children, but if only one child is the, the beneficiary of that policy, they're going to receive the assets. So you want to make sure that those both those pieces work and coordinate and work in conjunction. And I guess I, um, because of my job as a chief philanthropy officer, I've worked in um, charitable giving for mm -hmm. 25 to 30 years. And even those folks who feel like you know, their priority must be obviously their surviving children or relatives. Um, they may have a nonprofit organization or more than one nonprofit organization that they've supported over the years that they want to um, designate as a beneficiary mm -hmm. after all their assets are taken care of. So um, please give that thought, have conversations with um, your, your um, state attorney about what's important to you charitably so that um, you can name those organizations in your will as well. Absolutely, I think charitable giving is an important piece uh, for retirement planning, for financial planning and estate planning. And uh, many people do have that desire to give and they don't think maybe they have the assets during their life to give as much as they would like. Um, but being a beneficiary of a life insurance policy 
could be a great way to still uh, to leave a charitable uh, bequest. And I think um, some maybe children are so focused, adult children are so focused on the care of their elderly parents that they haven't engaged them in a conversation about mom, dad, what's important to you? Mm -hmm. You know, after you're gone, is there is there something you'd like um, to be able to continue supporting? So I think having those conversations early on so that you're not guessing after the fact. Absolutely. Communication, those are difficult conversations to have sometimes, yeah. but they're so important. Yeah. Um, I think we have one more question here. Um, how do I get my money when I retire? <laughs> Good question. Very important question. Um, so I think of that in several regards. Uh, you know, you'll be, if you've paid into Social Security or, you're, or you have a pension from work, that's one source of money. And so you'll want to uh, contact, as you approach retirement age, contact the Social Security office and uh, work towards applying for Social Security, understanding what your options are at various ages and uh, ultimately applying for Social Security. That's one way to get your money. Working with your employer, if you have a pension, uh, perhaps you work for the government or you're a teacher, uh, and understanding what your pension options are uh, is another source. And then as you, if perhaps you have a 401k, um, and that's your money. Uh, we had talked about rolling into an IRA, rolling those funds from the 401k into an IRA, and start thinking about those considerations. So you have a longer term plan in your name, in the IRA, that you can decide what is based on your retirement projections, what's an appropriate amount to withdraw each month, each quarter, each year. Mm -hmm. A lot to think about. There's, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts. I'm, yeah. I'm happy that some of the folks stayed on. Um, yes, to, thank you. To, despite the technology issues, and we have some questions from the chat. So one of Great. them is, is the market changing? Should we move from stocks to bonds? Well, that's a great question. The market is always changing. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a lot of concern because the market's been on a historic bull run, uh, up, upside for the past 12 years or so. So I would say it's highly dependent on your circumstances. It's highly dependent upon your risk tolerances and what your needs are. Um, so having a firm understanding of that, um, you know, each economic environment is going to benefit perhaps stocks over bonds or bonds over stocks, maybe both, maybe neither. So uh, I can't say that directly today, but I think as we talked about earlier, you will have goals and timelines for those goals and understanding that stocks, potentially riskier assets, should not be for shorter term goals, perhaps, or as, as much of an allocation for your shorter term goals. Those should be for longer term goals. And having an appropriate amount of investment risk, perhaps cash or bonds for those shorter term goals. So I think it's highly individualized and, and based on your goals and your risk tolerance. Not a great answer. Well, but, I mean, you've got to, um, obviously, like almost anything in life, you know, um, your everyone's situations may be different. Their absolutely. age their assets, um, their employment. And mm -hmm. so seeking out First National Bank or another financial institution for some one-on-one -on -one counseling is obviously important. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Consulting an uh, investment professional who does this day in and day out, I think is, is important. So I know the word, but maybe I don't know the definition. What is a fiduciary? Great question. A fiduciary is, is a person who is obligated, a, a person or an institution that is obligated to put the client's interest first. And so in the financial services world, there are uh, people who uh, only have a duty to um, do what's appropriate for a client. And then there's a fiduciary, which is everything has to be with the client centered and their obligations first. So the, putting the client ahead of your own interests. Um, as a fiduciary. So it is considered the highest standard of care uh, for advisors in the financial services world. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Should we be concerned about inflation? Well, um, it's a topic of interest. I'm it not is. surprised it, it came up. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing inflation numbers that have come up at 30 year highs yeah. recently at, at 6% and or thereabouts. And so I, I do think it's something to, to be concerned about and to think about, um, both from how you allocate your investments. 
So, you know, we talked about um, shorter term goals, having fixed income, bonds. Uh, but as interest rates go up, which is one way to combat inflation, the uh, that will impact the, the value of your bonds negatively. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a very tricky situation. It's certainly something to be concerned about, something to think about, something to talk to your investment advisor about, and how you structure your portfolio going forward. Mm -hmm. It really is unprecedented times yeah. right now. Um, I think the final question, what are some common errors people make when planning, making financial plans? I think the most common error people make are not starting. So yeah. even just thinking about starting a financial plan and thinking about your future is important. It's never too late to start doing that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have too many people that will contact us and say, I want to retire in six months. What should I do? Mm. Well, uh, we can tell you where you are now and maybe you need to make adjustments at that point. But I think the earlier you can start is better. Um, you know, I, I, I talked earlier in the, in, in the session about it's never too early to start. It's never too small amounts to start with. And, and that's really true. And that's, you know, the, I think the biggest mistake people make is they, they earn money. They want to spend money. They earn more money. Um, as their career progresses and they keep spending more money and, and not having savings goals, not understanding what your long-term retirement goals are and what it's going to take to reach those, I think is the biggest mistake people are making. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I told you before we started, I have a daughter who's you know, almost 27 and we both see the same financial advisor, but he speaks with us completely separately and it's Right. Our needs are completely different. He's Absolutely. he's talking to me right now about retirement. He's talking to my daughter about, you know, after graduate school, are you going to want to buy a house one day? Are right. you going to want to continue to travel? So, um, and after that, you know, you don't want to spend it all on those, you know, traveling, right. um, because you'll have needs after that. So, um, she's twenty six. I'm more than twenty six. So they're exactly <laughs> well, a good example of your point. I think a twenty six year old. Meeting with a professional and and having goals and saving towards those is phenomenal. And yeah. I think that's that's what in some form everyone should be doing, whether they're meeting with a professional at twenty six, mm -hmm. um, or at least understanding that they need to save, and some of the uh, issues that we talked about already today. Yeah. Well, um, again, we thank everyone in the audience for your patience. Yeah. Um, we certainly um, thank Mike, Mike Mattil, and First National Bank, who has been a sponsor of all three of these sessions in 2021. And um, we will follow up afterward with a link to the presentation so that you can um, catch up on all the things you may have missed because of not being able to hear everything. So Mike um, and everyone watching, we wish you a prosperous and a healthy holiday season and look forward to maybe more of these conversations in 2022. Thank you.